Chapter 9 Something Special It rained most of the night. Twice the loud drumming of the drops on the window panes woke me. I heard Aunt Sarah come to my door after the second time. She stood there gazing at me, her face in a shadow, her head silhouetted against the dim hallway light. I said nothing, and she finally closed the door softly. The rain stopped just before morning. After I dressed and went downstairs, I was surprised to find that most of the windows were crusted with salt. It reminded me of ice, and I remarked about it at breakfast. Aunt Sarah said it wasn't unusual after a storm. The salt even peels the paint from the window castings. The weather is so hard on us, but we endure it. The weather is hard on people everywhere, Uncle Jacob declared. But it's good to us, too, and we should be grateful for our blessings. Mark that, he said sharply, waving his long right forefinger at us like some biblical prophet. I can help you clean the windows after school today, I told Aunt Sarah. Why, thank you. It's kind of you to offer. Kind? She should do nothing less, Uncle Jacob fixed his eyes on me. Most young people today don't know what it is to have regular chores and responsibilities. They think that everything's owed to them just because they were born. I wanted to snap back at him and tell him that I, had been, I hadn't been brought up as spoiled and selfish. I did plenty of work around the home in Sewell, and I often helped Grandma Arlene and Papa George with their housework too. I never asked them for anything for it, and I never expected anything. It was enough that they gave me their love. I glared back at Uncle Jacob, the credits of my cheeks burning. He didn't know me. He had hardly spoken ten minutes to me in my whole life. What right did he have sitting on his high and mighty throne and lumping me with a spoiled young people that he saw in town? Carrie must have sensed the words at the tip of my tongue, for he shot me a look of warning before I had a chance to part my lips. I stared at him a moment and saw a gentle but definite shake of his head. I looked down at my hot cereal and swallowed back my anger, even though it threatened to get stuck in my throat and choke me all day. Your father is an ogre, I told Carrie after we left school in the morning. Carrie didn't reply for a few moments, and then he said, He's just afraid, that's all. Afraid, I nearly laughed. Your father? Afraid of what? Of losing another one of us. Carrie marched on, his lips tight and his eyes so focused on the street that he barely glanced at me the remainder of the walk to school. Despite what Carrie said, I think he was ashamed at how his father sometimes behaved. Since it's Friday and the end of the school day, Betty, Lorraine, and Janet reminded me of their beach party Saturday night. I said I'd try to go, but I reminded them that I couldn't go without permission. Then you won't be there, Betty predicted. You'll miss a great time. I can't help it. I have to ask my uncle and aunt first. My mother left them in charge of me. Just do what Janet told you to do. Tell them that you're going over there to study, Lorraine instructed. A little white lie is no big deal. We all do it. It sounds more than a little white lie. If my uncle found out I lied, he won't find out, Betty assured me. We don't tell on each other. Of course, if you did tell Grandpa, he'll turn you in, Janice said. Stop calling him Grandpa, I snapped. He's not anything like an old man. Oh, why do you say that? Do you know something we don't? She asked quickly. The girls all smiled, waiting with expectation for my reply. No, I said. Did you get him to smoke the joint? No. He didn't see it. And tell your uncle, did he? Lorraine asked quickly. If my uncle even thought I had something like that, he'd turn you over to the police, she suggested. 
He turned his own mother over to the police, Betty added. Do you still have it or did you smoke it yourself last night, Betty asked. No, I didn't smoke it. I didn't want to tell them that I had simply thrown it out. You can smoke it at the beach party, Janet said. Let's go, girls, Betty said. Be at Janet's house at eight. You won't be sorry. Adam Jackson will be at the beach party, Lorraine sang back to me as they all walked off. I watched them go down the hallway, and then I hurried out to meet Carrie to walk home. I wanted to tell him about the party and ask his opinion, but I was afraid to even mention it. I know how much he didn't like these girls, but I wanted to go. I had never been to a beach party, and I had to admit, Adam Jackson's eyes had been in my dreams last night. I decided to wait until after dinner when I was helping Aunt Sarah with the dishes. She'd done the windows herself, even the upstairs one. I would have helped you, I told her. I know, but don't fret about it. Work gets me through the day. Jacob always says idle hands make for mischief. I shook my head. What sort of mischief could she commit? And why did she permit her husband to treat her as if she was another one of his children and not his wife, his equal in the house? She did everything he asked without a single complaint. He should worship the ground that she walks on. My daddy would have done that for my mother, I thought. The more I learned about this family, the more it was a mystery to me. Aunt Sarah, I was invited to a party Saturday night. Oh, a party already? What sort of party? Birthday? School party? No, some of the girls in my class are having a hot dog roast on the beach, I said. It starts at about 8 o'clock. What girls? I gave her names. She thought for a moment. Those are girls from good families, but you'll have to ask your uncle, she said. Why can't you give me the permission? You'll have to ask your uncle for something like that, she replied. I could see the very idea of her solely giving me permission terrified her. She busied herself with dishware. If I wanted to go to the beach party, I would have to talk to Uncle Jacob about it. There was no avoiding it. He was in the living room reading his paper after dinner as usual. I approached him with my request. Excuse me, Uncle Jacob, I said from the doorway. He slowly lowered his paper, his eyebrows tilting and the skin folding along his forehead. I couldn't recall speaking to Daddy without seeing a smile in his eyes or his lips. Yes? Some of the girls in my class at school are having a party on the beach tomorrow night and they've invited me. Aunt Sarah said I should ask for your permission. I'd like to go. It's the fastest way to get to know people, I offered as a practical reason. He nodded. It don't surprise me that you'd like to go to a party where there'll be no adult supervising. What do you mean? He leaned forward with a smile. Do you think that I know what goes on at those beach parties? How they drink and smoke dope and debauch themselves? De what? Perversions, he declared. That irritating forefinger raised like a flag of righteousness again. Young girls parade around reveal in their revealing clothing and roll around on blankets with young men to lose their innocence. It's pagan. While you're under my roof, you'll live decent, look decent, and act decent, even if it flies in the face of your instincts. He snapped his paper like a whip. Now I don't want to hear another word about it. What instincts, I asked. He ignored me. I am decent. I've never done anything to shame my parents. He peered over the paper at me. It would take something to shame them, I suppose. But I know what's in the blood, what's raging. If you give free reign, it will take you straight to hell and damnation. I don't understand. What's raging in my blood? No more talk, he screamed. I flinched and stepped back as if slapped. My heart began to pound. A white line had etched itself on tightened my lips. I had never seen rage inflamed by such a small spark. All I did was ask to go to a party. I turned away and marched upstairs. The girls were right, I fumed. I should have just lied and said I was going to Janet's to study. 
Lying to such a man wasn't wrong. He didn't deserve honesty. Carrie was at the foot of the attic stairway waiting for me to reach the landing. What was all the yelling about? I told him and he snorted. You should have asked me. I would have spared you his reaction to such a request. Why is he so mean? I told you, he's not mean. He's just afraid. I don't understand. What is he so afraid of? Carrie stared at me a moment, then blurted, because he believes it was my fault and that he was being punished. He turned away to go up his ladder. What was his fault? I drew closer and moved up to the rungs. Laura's death. I don't understand. How could that have been his fault? Was it because he gave her permission to go sailing? No, Carrie said, not turning and still climbing. Then I don't understand. Explain it, I demanded. My tone of voice turned him around. He gazed down at me with a mixture of anger and pain in his face. My father doesn't believe in accidents. He believes we're punished on earth for the evil that we do on earth, and we're rewarded for the good that we do as well. It was what he was brought up to believe, and it's what he's taught us. Do you believe that too? Yes, he said, but not convincingly. My daddy was a good man, a kind man. Why was he killed in an accident? You don't know what his sins were, he said, and turned away and continued up the stairs. He had no sins, nothing so great that he should have been dead for it. Did you hear me, Carrie Logan? I rushed to the ladder and seized it, shaking it. Carrie! He paused at the top and gazed down before pulling up his ladder. None of us know the darkness that lingers in another heart. He sounded just like his father. That's stupid. That's another stupid religious idea, I retorted, but he ignored me and continued to lift the ladder. I seized the bottom rung and held it down. He looked down, surprised at my surge of strength. Let go. I'll let go, but don't think that I don't know what you're doing up there every night, I said. His face turned so red that I could see the crimson in his cheek in the dim hallway light. You're running away from tragedy, only you can't run from something that's part of you. He tugged with all his strength, nearly lifting me from the floor with the ladder. I had to let go as the ladder went up, and he slammed the trap door shut. Good riddance, I screamed. May locked in her world of silence, emerged from her room with a smile on her face. In my mind, she was the luckiest one in this damned house. She signed to me, asked me if I'd let her come into my room. I told her yes. She followed me in and watched me angrily poke at my needle and thread, trying to do what Laura was doing before she died. As I worked, I glared up at the ceiling and then down at the floor below which my cold-hearted uncle sat reading his paper. After a while, the mechanical work was calming and meditating. I began to understand why Laura might have embraced doing so much of it. Everyone in this house was searching for a doorway. May remained with me until her bedtime, practicing communication skills, asking me questions about myself, my family, and our lives back in West Virginia. She was full of curiosity, sweetness, somehow unscathed by the turmoil that raged in every family member's heart. Perhaps her world wasn't so silent after all. Perhaps she had a different music, different sounds, all of it from her free, innocent imagination. When her eyelids began drifting downward, I told her she should go to bed. I was tired myself. I feel like I had been spun around in an emotional washing machine and then left in the dryer until my last tear evaporated. Carrie lingered in his attic hideaway almost all night. I was woke just before the morning and the sound of his footsteps coming down the ladder. He paused at my doorway for a moment before going to his own. He was up with the sunlight a little over an hour later and had gone out with Uncle Jacob by the time that I went down to breakfast. 
Aunt Sarah said they were going to be out lobstering all day. I walked to town with May and we spent most of the afternoon looking at quaint shops on Commercial Street. Then we watched the fishermen down at the wharf. It wasn't quite tourism season yet, but the warm spring weather still brought a crowd up from Boston and the outlining areas. There was a lot of traffic. Aunt Sarah had given us some spending money so we could buy hamburgers for lunch. She didn't mind my taking May along with me. She saw how much May wanted to be with me and that I was growing more confident with sign language. Aunt Sarah remarked how quickly and how well I had been learning it. Laura was the best at it, she told me, even better than Carrie. What about Uncle Jacob, I asked her. Doesn't he know it? A little. He's always too busy to practice, she said. But I thought it was a weak excuse. If my daddy had to learn sign language to communicate with me, there would be nothing more important, I thought. About midday, I counted the change that I had left and went to the payphone. It wasn't enough to call Suell, but I took the chance to do a collect call to Alice. Luckily, she was home and accepted the charges. I'm sorry I told her I didn't have enough money. That's okay, where are you? I'm in Providence Town on Cape Cod living with my uncle and aunt. Living with them? Why? Mommy's gone up to New York as an opportunity for a model or an actress, I said. If she doesn't get the job there, then she's going to go to Chicago or Los Angeles. So I had to stay here and enroll in school. You did? What's that like? I told her about this school and the way my life was at my uncle's house. Laura's disappearance and death and May's handicap. It sounds sad. It's hard to live with them, especially with my cousin Carrie. He's so bitter about everything, but I keep telling myself I won't be here long. What are the girls like in school? They're different, I told her. They seem to know more about things and do more things. Like what? I told her how they'd given me a joint of marijuana in the school cafeteria. What did you do? You haven't smoked it, have you? No, I was scared. Actually, I was terrified because a teacher came to our table. Afterward, the girls weren't looking, and I threw it in the garbage. That's what I would have done, Alice said. Maybe you should stay away from them. They invited me to their beach party tonight, but my uncle won't let me go. A beach party? She hesitated with some envy and said, sounds like fun. Maybe you're going to like living there after all. I don't think so, I said. I wish I was back at home. I was passing the cemetery yesterday and I thought about you, so I went and said a little prayer at your father's grave for you. Did you? Thank you, Alice. I miss you. Maybe if you're still there, I can come up and visit you this summer. That would be great, but I expect to be gone here by then. Mommy's coming to get me as soon as she gets settled, which reminds me, have you seen Grandma Arlene? Mommy was supposed to contact her to send me my things. I saw her, but George is really sickly. I know, I think he's got, I think he may be in the hospital. Oh no, would you please tell Grandma Arlene I called? I'll go right over to see her, Alice promised. I gave her my uncle's name and telephone number and she promised to call me next weekend. I really have no friends since you left, she admitted in our conversations and it brought tears to my eyes. After I hung up, May wanted to know why I was crying. I tried to explain, but I really didn't know enough sign language to reveal the pain in my heart. It was easier just to go home. When we arrived, Aunt Sarah explained that dinner was going to be different this night. Uncle Jacob invited another lobster man and his wife, the DeMacros. May, Carrie, and I were to eat first and be gone by the time the adults sat at the table. I thought that was a blessing and was grateful for a meal without Jacob glaring at us as if we were 
as if I was one of the Jezebels that he saw in every corner. However, late in the afternoon, Carrie and Uncle Jacob returned home in a very happy mood. Apparently, they had one of the best days at sea. A catch of 15 lobsters, as well as a dozen good-sized striped bass. To celebrate, Carrie declared that he, May, and I were going to enjoy a New England feast. Clam chowder, steel mussels, steamed mussels, grilled striped bass, potatoes, and vegetables. Carrie said that he would prepare the fish himself outside on the barbecue grill. Mother's busy with her own dinner. We can have our own picnic, he said. Fine, I told him. It wouldn't be as exciting as the beach party, I'm afraid. I said fine. He nodded and told May, who was very pleased with the idea. You two can get set the picnic table if you like. I nodded without smiling, even though I was happy with the idea. Carrie went preparing the meal meticulously. He was much better at it than I expected. None of the boys I knew in West Virginia knew the first thing about preparing fish and vegetables. He thanked me, and when May and I finished eating, I decided to make a civil conversation. I still don't understand how you fish for lobster, I said, standing nearby and watching him grill the fish. You don't need a pole? He laughed. We don't fish for them exactly. We set traps at the bottom of the ocean floor and attach buoys that float above. How do the other fishermen know that the trap is there, which one's theirs and which one's yours? Each lobster fisherman has his own colors and his own buoys. We're using the same colors my great-grandfather used. They sort of belong in the family, like a coat of arms or something. Understand? I nodded. After we bring up the trap, if there's a lobster in it, we measure it and gouge out the eyes. An average lobster runs anywhere from two to five pounds. My father once brought up a trap with a lobster in it that weighed over 30. 30? Yeah, someone else trapped one close to 40 last year. Lobsters with legs on their tails have to be thrown back immediately. We have to do all we can to keep up the supply. It takes about seven and a half years for a lobster to grow a decent size. Seven and a half years? Uh-huh, he said smiling. Now you know why we grow harvest cranberries too. Is this what you want to do for the rest of your life? I asked him. He nodded. You don't want to go to college? My college is out there, he said, pointing to the ocean with the fork. There's more to life than just fishing and sailing. There's wonderful places to visit on land, wonderful things to see. I see enough here. I never saw someone so young act so... What, he asked quickly. I swallowed back the words that I chose and I came up with less painful ones. Grown up, he nodded. Go on, he said. If you want to call me grandpa too, you can, I don't care. You're nothing like Grandpa. He looked at me curiously for a moment. I felt since he was being honest, I should be. But you're too fixed on your thinking for someone your age. You should have a more open mind about things. Sure, he said, and be willing to smoke dope and drink and waste my time like those other jerks in school. They're not all jerks, are they? Most are. You can be pretty infuriating, I told him. He shrugged and began serving his fish. I don't bother anyone and just ask. They don't bother me, he said. Let's eat. He made sure May had her meal first. Then 
the way he took care of her. He saw to her needs and happiness, and it softened my frustration and anger towards him. How hard it was for May when Laura died, I asked him as we sat at the picnic table. Real hard, he said. Poor thing, to have such a tragedy on top of the handicap. She does fine, he said angrily. No one is saying she doesn't carry. You don't have to jump down my throat. There's such a thing as being protective, you know? You can never be too protective, he replied. Once you go out there, you'll understand, he nodded towards the ocean. When am I going to go out there? He was silent. I've never been on a sailboat. Daddy used to take us to the beach, but Mommy hated boats, so we just went swimming and got suntans. What a bunch of tourists, he quipped. You shouldn't make fun of tourists. They buy your lobsters, don't they? And ruin everybody's litter at the beach. Li ruin everybody with litter at the beach. Poison the water and make fun of us. I think you'd be happy just being a hermit, I concluded. It didn't faze him. He shrugged. This is good, I told him after we ate some of the fish. Thanks, he said, without any feeling. You're welcome, I growled. We ate silently, shooting darts at each other with our eyes. But when we turned to May and saw her staring at us and smiling with a wide smile of amusement, Carrie's eyes shifted to mine. We gazed at each other for another moment, then we had to laugh. It was the sheet of ice that had cracked and then let in warm air. Our conversation lightened up and I talked about scenery. I was taken with the apricot glow of the sunset as we looked over at the ocean. I hadn't realized how beautiful the ocean could be. That pleased him and he revealed that when he was a little boy, he and Laura would lie on their backs in their father's rowboat at dusk and watch the sky change colors. It seemed magical, he said. It is. There was real warmth in his eyes and I thought about, I thought the girls were right. He is good looking when he wanted to be. Suddenly though, he became self-conscious and quickly reverted to his seriousness with a hard look. However, after dinner, I helped him clean up, and he surprised me by suggesting that we walk to town with May for some frozen custard and see what damage the outsiders are doing, he added, and what money they're leaving in the local merchants, I added. He hid a smile, but I caught it. For the first time when we walked with May, he allowed her to hold both our hands. Carrie led us a different way that took us past high grass, bushes, and scrub oak trees. I heard the peepers in the marsh. Teresa and her brothers and sisters and her father lived down there, he pointed when we turned the corner. I gazed at the street that wound east. The houses were small and the grass in their yards were spotty and rough. Closer to town, the houses were nicer with real lawns and flowers like yellow tea rose and a bed of Queen Anne lace, dark purple iris and hydrogenias. The Cape was truly amazing. Toward the ocean, there were rolls and rolls of sand that looked as dry and sparse as any desert. But a short distance away were oak trees, blueberry bushes, red maple trees, and houses with lawns that had clusters of tulips and sprawling lilac bushes. It seemed like two different worlds, Carrie said. There are often two kinds of weather. It could be stormy on the east with the sun shining brightly on the west. Perhaps the differences in land explain the differences in people, I thought. Some hard, 
frugal with religious ideas carved in stone, and others carefree, impulsive, jolly, and hungry for fun and excitement. Some lived to work and some worked to live. At night, the little town was exciting, especially with all the people and the music from the bars and restaurants and carloads of tourists yelling at each other. My eyes went everywhere. He bought May her frozen custard and asked me if I wanted one too. I did, and he got himself one as well. May wanted to go to the dock and watch the deep sea fishermen try to entice the tourists to hire them. I had never been a real tourist in town at night before, and I was taken with the lights and the way that the owners and desert tour operators barked at the people tempting and conjoiling and practically begging for their business. I hate these desert tours, Carrie remarked when we, when a jeep lulled by. Once a couple of jeeps pulled up behind our house and a guide pointed to my mother and Laura describing them as native fishermen women. So that's when your mother, so that's what your mother is, right? She's not a freak for tourists to gape at, no, he said, and Laura certainly was not. How would they like to sightsee, sightseeing bus coming around their backyards and having people gape at them while they did their housework? I nodded, understanding some of his anger. You're right, that isn't nice. He looked appreciative, but quickly checked his smile and gazed at May. Better get back, he said, May's sleepy. When we returned to the house, Uncle Jacob was entertaining his fisherman friend in the living room while their wives chatted up in the kitchen. When we went, we went directly upstairs. May went to sleep quickly. Thanks for the custard and the walk, I told Carrie in the hallway. Are you tired? No, not very, I said. Want to see something special? Sure. Come on, he said, leading the way down the stairs. We stepped quietly through the house, but Uncle Jacob heard us and came to the living room doorway. Where are you going now, son, he asked. Just going to check on the bog, Carrie replied. Uncle Jacob looked at me, his eyes growing smaller, before he nodded softly and returned to his company. Carrie said nothing. He hurried out of the house and led me over the ground to the hill. When we reached the top, he paused and we gazed at the bog. The moonlight played tricks with the blossoms. They dazzled like jewels in the night. What do you think, he asked. It's beautiful. I thought you might like it. To our right, the ocean roared in darkness. I embraced myself. Cold? A little, I admitted. I bet you really wanted to go to the beach party, he said. I've never been to one. All they do is smoke dope or drink around the fire. Some of them go off into the darkness, of course. Don't you want a girlfriend someday, I asked him. When I find someone sensible, I'll speak to her, he replied. No one sensible? And pretty too, he admitted. He stood there with his hands in his pocket, kicking the sand and occasionally glancing at me and then the ocean. What about you? What? Did you get a boyfriend back in the West Virginia? For a while I was steady, but after Daddy died, I stopped going to school dances and things. Yeah, I didn't want to do anything after Laura died. I didn't want to work or ever go back to school. That was the only good thing about us leaving Sewell, I told him. Not having to go to the places Daddy and I used to go to anymore, and not having to look at the coal mines and wait for him to come home. He thought a moment. I couldn't leave here ever. Most of the younger people I knew were always thinking about getting away from here someday. Not me. This is where I belong, where I'm meant to be. I got salt water in my blood. I laughed. 
I probably won't graduate anyway, he added. Why not? Doing pretty bad in English. Badly. What? You're doing badly, not bad. See what I mean? Maybe I can help you. I'm very good at English. It's probably too late. If I don't pass the final, then you'll pass it, I told him. I'll help you every night, okay? I don't know. I don't know if I even care. You've got to care. Besides, I'm sure that you'll do well if you try. He smiled. I understand. Laura was a good student. Didn't she help you? He looked away instead of answering, and then he turned back and started down the hill. Let's go back to the house. I followed him. When we entered the house again, Uncle Jacob asked Carrie in to talk about the lobster business with them. I told them good night and went to my room to read. A little while later, I heard Carrie go up to his attic hideaway. I listened to him scuffle about and then grew quiet. But for muffled voices of Jacob and Aunt Sarah and their friends below, my eyelids felt heavy and I dozed off, woke up, went to the bathroom and returned and dressed myself for bed. After I put the lights out, I gazed out the window and saw the moon walk on the ocean. How beautiful. Had Laura looked out this window and been thrilled by it? What was she really like? I had Aunt Sarah's constant descriptions, comparisons and remarks, but somehow I thought they were more to her daughter than she knew. Carrie knew, I thought. She'd been his twin, but I was, but he was afraid or unwilling to talk about her. It would take time, but more importantly, it would take trust. I wondered if he, I could ever get him to trust me with the secrets of his heart. I knew he had secrets buried deeply. I closed my eyes and lay back on my pillow and thought about mommy. Where was she tonight? I swallowed back my tears and pressed for sleep to keep myself from thinking sad thoughts. What? Was that what Carrie did every night? <laughs>